We are beginning a new series uh, today, and it's going to go for about a month. Uh, we're going to be looking at a topic called One Month to Live. What if you found out you had one month to live? Kind of a, 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 a probing question, and maybe is a bit of a different take on the whole uh, kind of what's my... Uh, New Year's resolutions or whatever. This is more an evaluative kind of approach to this. More, you know, you're not necessarily going to make a list, but asking some good questions that make <laughs> us reflect and wonder really about what we're doing and, and where we're headed. And so we want to take a month. This is a good month, uh, January. You're kind of looking out across 2018 and saying, you know, how, uh, where's my life going? What, what, what's this thing all about? And so we're going to look at this question. What would it mean if you had one month to live? There was a man that wasn't doing very well. And uh, so his wife took him to the doctors. They did all, they ran all these tests. And they came back pretty bad. Uh, in fact, so bad, the, the doctor actually asked the husband to step out. And he's, he wanted to just talk to the wife first and explain. <clears throat> he has a very serious condition. Uh, now, there is some good news with, with a very uh, aggressive regiment and some uh, a lot of support with her. That there was hope. There was hope. Um, her part would be that uh, she would, he couldn't really do a whole lot, so she was going to have to wait on him hand and foot and not allow him to do anything. She had to feed him. He had to keep up his energy, so make every single day three square meals, everything he liked, just the way he liked it. And he needed to kind of keep up his, his enthusiasm, so she needed to be intimate with him at least once a day. And, she went, and he said, if you do this for six months, I think we've got a good chance that we'll go into recovery and live a long, healthy life. And she says, oh, thank you, doctor. This is, this is, uh, this is good to know. Uh, I'd like to talk to you with my husband about it. And the doctor said, I understand. And he stepped out, sent him in. He came in and she sat him down and said, honey, the doctor said you're going to die. <laughs> All right. Well, this type of a question usually is connected with a, a much more serious situation than that. Uh, you go to the doctors and you hear something that's uh, pretty devastating. And, and you've probably known somebody that's gone through that where... It has gone pretty quick. Uh, but this isn't just about disease. This can be our lives are really changing and uh, uh, anything can really happen. And so we want to kind of probe this for ourselves of going, if you knew you only had one month to live, whether it was through the doctors or through a crystal ball or an angel came down and said, hey, you got 30 days, what would it mean? Now, honestly, I don't know that any of us, for the most of us, we can't really answer that question. We, we could talk about it in almost an academic sense and go, well, gee, I want to reassess my, some of my priorities. And I, but there is, there is something about this that for someone actually in that situation, it is very real and very powerful. You see people in those situations facing uh, a coming end with a reality, it, it impacts them. For us, it kind of sets aside, it's, it's a distance from us because we can't quite really grab hold of it. It doesn't become real to us in part because we keep it at arm's length. Truly, we don't think about this. We go about our lives going, man, I'm, I know it's going to happen eventually. You know, everybody knows Nobody's making out it, making it off this planet alive here. So we know it kind of intellectually that, that this is true, but there is no real sense that we go about our days of going, oh, you know, at any moment. Because none of us are guaranteed. None of us. But we're going to try our best. We're going to try and kind of go into this. Now, this isn't just a question to go, you know, if you kind of get to the end, how would you do your last 30 days? This is... If where you're at in your life, whether you're at a young age, maybe you're at an older age, uh, what, if I knew it, if I knew 30 days was all I had, 
well, what would it change for me? And how does that apply for me in my situation where I don't have just 30 days? We want to bring that reality into this. Now, we often don't want to talk about it. I know this for a fact. Uh, one of the little known facts about me is that I actually sold cemetery plots for about three months. Boy, you want to talk about a tough job. People don't want to talk about this at all. They get all freaked out about it and like, oh man, if we make plans, that means something bad's going to happen to me. For a lot of people, this is a nerve wracking thing. It can be left intellectually, but boy, when you bring it into reality, it really shudders us. And it should. It, it, it's a major thing. It is the one thing that no one escapes. No matter how rich you are, no matter how powerful you are, everyone comes to this, to this place. But we defend ourselves, we hold it off, we ignore it, we deny it, we just kind of go, well, it is what it is. But here's the cool thing. The Bible invites us into this place. It doesn't, the Bible has no, no teaching, nowhere where it says, you know what, kind of ignore this reality, ignore this fact. In fact, it does quite the opposite. It invites us into this place and it's a part of the spiritual journey we have. So while we may go, well, this may not be the most exciting question I could have come to, to begin 2018, the Bible is inviting us to do this. One of many places it talks about this is in Psalms. 90 it says lord you speak and man humanity turns back to dust a thousand years are but yesterday as yesterday to you they are like a single hour we glide along the tides of time as swiftly as a racing river and vanish as quickly as a dream we are like grass that is green in the morning and then mowed down and withered before the evening shadows fall. This is not one kind of uh, one passage. This is a, a passage that actually uh, uh, informs the rest of the, uh, of the Bible, the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament. A lot of these themes and ideas of going, we are but dust. We are temporary. We are fragile. You know, the New Testament picks up on this exact imagery and goes, the, flat, the grass, the grass. Easy for you to say. Yeah, easy for me to say. The grass withers, the flower falls, and they use it as a contrast, but the word of the Lord stands forever. It's not talking about grass and, and flowers, folks. It's talking about us. It talks about the things that we set up, the things that we imagine, the empires, no matter how powerful they are or however they've been, they've all come to an end. They've all come crumbling down. It's this really this core idea of going, we are really small. Our time races like a river. I wonder, it's been interesting as I'm watching my kids grow up, of going, my youngest has just hit double digits, all right? I mean, think about that. A year is a tenth of his life. For us, a year, you know, you get older and suddenly a year almost is like, eh, that just starts clicking off and it starts speeding up. This, this universal experience of just kind of like, wow, things really start getting moving along and you blink and what? It's 10, 5, 10. 20 years later, suddenly, the Bible talked about that. This is the experience. Time just kind of starts moving along for us and it takes us down. And no matter how much we go, boy, we're really going to set this up compared to God who is everlasting to everlasting. You're just a passing shadow. This, the, the psalmist invites us in and says, this is our reality, whether it unsettles you, whether it scares you, whether you go on to deny it, it's something that we have to all face. I want you to take a look at a short video of an interview with a lady named 
uh, Stacy McCulley. Uh, she's from uh, LifeChurch.tv, and someone that is facing some this reality in life. Take a look. Well, I'm, I'm kind of everyone's, every breast cancer survivor's worst nightmare, really, because I was first diagnosed in 2004 uh, with stage one. And I came back with my nodes clean and everything, and I, I did chemo, and I, I did the double mastectomy, I did everything right. And, but for some odd reason, um, the cancer went to the lymph node behind my breastbone, which is practically unheard of. And so it was allowed to grow there for several years. It didn't cause me any problems. And now it's in my bones, so I'm considered stage four. And um, unless there's a miracle, you know, I'm gonna be going home soon. And I'm kind of double-minded about it because there's part of me that is I'm kind of excited in a weird way, you know, because I'm, I'm, I know where I'm going and it's going to be a great place. And then, but there's this other part of me that's not ready to go yet. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm too young. And I feel for the people that I'm leaving behind, you know, especially my girls. <sighs> Probably not going to see them grow up, you know, I feel cheated out of grandbabies, I feel cheated out of weddings, I, I feel, you know, I'm double-minded, I have this, this, I have this argument with myself, two different feelings about this same thing, you know, and I feel for people who don't have a relationship with God and they're going through this, I don't know how they do it, I really don't, and I even feel for those people who maybe do have a relationship but don't really know Him. I mean, know Him to the very core of your being. Know that He is good. Know that He loves you. Because it, sometimes it doesn't seem like that. It doesn't seem like He's good. And it doesn't seem like He loves me. You know, and, but since I know that with every inch of me, you know, that's, that's my hope and that's my comfort. And I, I really do feel for anyone who does not have that foundation. A hard story to hear, a story that we're not unfamiliar with. When we come face to face with this reality, when we get in line with really what the Bible describes as the truth about our, our existence, one of the reasons it's so offensive to us, so shuddering, is it breaks the illusion of control that we believe that we have. Uh, we walk through our lives going, I control all these things, when in fact there's a very few things that we control. And, these, and death is one of those things that not only inevitably comes, but comes at a time and in a way rarely of our choosing, or of our expectation. And the Bible says this is good to ponder. It does. It says that we need to step into this. In fact, what I call this, I, I go, this is the beginning of theology. It's not God is love. It's not God is powerful. Uh, a few years ago, it was a very popular uh, kind of saying. I think they put it on T-shirts. Because if it's on a T-shirt, it's got to be right. Um, you know, there's two truths. There is a God, and I'm not him. Right? Right? <laughs> What's the number one way that we know we're not him? Because we come to an end. It was striking to me when Steve Jobs was getting sick and he was coming to the end. Here's a man that is an earth mover, a shaker, you know, an inventor, an entrepreneur. I mean, he is the pinnacle of Americanism, of power and ability and savvy and suddenly all of that is brought to a humbling end one of his uh, musings towards the end was i hope i hope we're not like just a computer and you just turn it off and there's nothing that's an interesting way of approaching this, of not being able to answer that question. 
what is next. Psalm 90 doesn't leave us here. A few verses later, he goes, now this isn't about just kind of being in a depressing mood. It is to bring us to a place of asking for guidance. He prays, teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them wisely as we should. We are to number our days. Not to ignore it, not to avoid it, but to recognize this truth because it brings us into this place of really understanding our relationship with God, our need for God, for his wisdom in our life. That these are precious gifts, the moments and the days and the years. As powerful as this is, the danger is, is that we squander our time. We worry about squandering money. We worry about squandering uh, job opportunities. But time is the one thing that you are given and you can never get back. And God is asking us, will we let him teach us to number our days? How do we do that? There was a professor in seminary. He, uh, I was in agreement with him. I thought this was a great exercise. We wanted to go out in the middle of this beautiful landscaped uh, a quad in the middle of all these magnificent buildings and we wanted to dig four foot by seven foot six foot down have a ladder and a chair down there and every pastor or pastor wannabe would have to spend at least an hour before they could graduate sitting down there contemplating their end i don't know that a lot of people are excited about that but him and i thought that was a really great idea although did you hear about in J in Japan? There's a company that does this. They will have you go through a death experience and do a, an evaluation of your life, and it ends. It culminates where they put you in a casket. They close the lid for like 15 minutes. You know, you have oxygen and so forth, and you know they write letters to their family as though this, and it's this powerful experience. Nah, I don't think that we need to do that. That's not what it is to count our days. Uh, although that excites you, go for it. It is about starting to get that perspective, though, of evaluating how am I spending my time, that most precious of commodities, to go, these are few, they are precious, and I need God's wisdom to make sure that I don't waste it. We've just finished 2017, as John Lennon, the great theologian, said. And this, so this is Christmas, and what have you done? You're another year older, and the new one's begun. We go to God and we ask him to teach us to number our days, to say what's important. In Psalm 39, he picks up this idea as well. He builds on it. He says, Lord, help me to realize how brief my time on earth will be. Help me to know that I am here for but a moment more. My life is no longer than my hand. My whole lifetime is but a moment to you. And now he kind of goes big here. He goes, proud humanity, frail as breath, a shadow. And all of our busy rushing." Ends in nothing. He heaps up riches for someone else to spend. But as for me, Lord, my hope is in you. You see the contrast here? That's what he's setting up. He's starting with the truth. This is what we are. We are temporary. We are frail. Now we can go, I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to get busy. I'm going to do all these things. I'm going to ignore that truth. Or we embrace it and we say, God, this means all the more I put my trust in you. I want us to return to Stacy here and uh, a follow-up interview of kind of how she continues to process this and see where she lands. You know, I feel like I want to be more present in the moment because I don't have very many moments left 
And so I just, I try to enjoy every moment. And um, even in the mundane things, you know, I mean, that's the harder thing to do, but even in the mundane things, I try to just enjoy it. Even if that means, you know, talking to God or singing to him, you know. Um, but I, I try not to take anything for granted because we're, we're not guaranteed anything, you know. And I know I don't have much, many moments left. So I want to enjoy every bit of it. You, you've got to really have a relationship with him, not just religion, but a relationship with him. Because there will be something that's going to come along that's going to knock you off your feet and you're going to need him. And so I am just a totally different person than I was seven years ago. But I also think I'm a lot different person than I was in May, you know, because I am starting to number my days to write and gain a heart of wisdom, you know. It's what's important. Things aren't important. Going places, that's not important. Um, family friends, relationships, that's what's important. It really is. It's the only thing that you can really, I guess, in a way, take with you in your heart, you know? Don't expect tomorrow to come. It may not be there. You, need to, you can't wait until you're sick to start living because, to be honest with you, a lot of the time you don't feel good enough to do what you want to do, you know? You need to start living now. Now, there's no wait until the doctor tells you. You need to fix the relationship now. You need to live in the moment now. You need to enjoy yourself and the people that you're with now. Don't wait. We're gonna spend the next four weeks because you only got 30 days, four weeks, looking at some different ways that we can be learning how to count our days, to number our days and make them count. But the very first thing we wanna always make sure of, no technique is gonna, is gonna uh, solve that. This isn't just a, a different of mind perspective. It begins with this truth that she talks about of going, my relationship with the Lord is the very cornerstone of who she is and how she processes. Just like what the psalmist is saying. He doesn't deny the truth. He goes, yep, this is true. The busyness and the wastefulness is true. But I put my trust in you. You are make you make my feet firm, even in the midst of not knowing what the future holds. So we're gonna spend this over the next, uh, next uh, four weeks on the back of your connection card. Uh, uh, giving you some, some starter steps here, you know, okay, you, you know what, I want to kind of embrace this series and uh, work through it. Um, I want to ask God to be kind of showing this to me. You could read the two Psalms in full and see their whole context. Um, or if you really want to dive into this, this is based off of, off of a book written uh, by, a, by a husband and wife team called One Month to Live. And uh, we're going to be working through this and saying, what God, how can you show us your wisdom and teach us to number your days? Let's pray. Lord, we are fragile and frail. We don't like to admit it. It scares us. It terrifies us. It shakes us when we are forced to face it. But Lord, you invite us to this place of vulnerability, not so not to scare us, not to not to defeat us, but for us to catch a, a a greater glimpse of who you are and our connection to you and what you mean in our life. Lord, we want to be on this journey for the next month to learn your wisdom to number our days. Guide us.